Labour's first budget in 14 years. Will it deliver what they promised? What about economic growth? Will we feel better off after a full term of Labour government? Whatever else you think of it, it's a whopper of a budget with plenty to discuss. Tonight we're in Guildford in Surrey. This area has been a safe Conservative seat until the recent summer general election when it was taken by the Liberal Democrats. But our audience here, as always, reflects the electoral picture across the nation. They also want to ask, why aren't we having more babies? I tell you, we discuss it all on Question Time. Welcome to the programme. We have Darren Jones as Chief Secretary of the Treasury. He's been at the right hand of the Chancellor throughout the months of budget preparations and delivery in the Commons yesterday, of course. From the Conservatives, Andrew Griffith is Shadow Secretary of State for Science before politics. He had senior roles at Just Eat and Sky before becoming Chief Business Advisor to then Prime Minister Boris Johnson in 2019. Manira Wilson is the Liberal Democrat spokesperson on education. After training as a tax consultant and then a decade as a lobbyist, she became MP for Twickenham three years years ago and is now one of 72 Lib Dem MPs. The entrepreneur and philanthropist Sir Tom Hunter started selling shoes from the back of his van, a business that grew to become Sports Division, the largest independent sports retailer in Europe. In 1998 he sold that and set up the Hunter Foundation, which sponsors educational and entrepreneurial projects around the world. And after a career in journalism, when incidentally he was my boss at the 6 and 10 o'clock news, Sir Craig Oliver became Prime Minister David Cameron's Head of Communications in 2011. He then wrote a book about Brexit, now presents a podcast and works in public affairs. Good evening. Welcome to our panellists. Welcome to our audience here in Guildford. Great to see you all. And of course, welcome to you at home. Great to see you as well. Remember, you can watch the programme in all sorts of ways, not just on BBC One, but also on iPlayer. And you can listen to it on BBC Sounds. Now, it's a kind of article of faith of Question Time that the panel do not know the questions. So let's have our first one from Janet. Janet Garcia. Last summer, I voted Labour for the first time in my life <clears throat> because of their message had a singular focus on growth. As someone employing hundreds of people, how does yesterday's budget inspire business confidence and economic growth? Well, Janet, since you are an employer of hundreds of people, as you say, what was your take out from the budget yesterday? How do you feel about it? Well, the messaging so far has been one of, of um, prepare yourself, it's going to be tough. So I've been somewhat paralysed with a lack of confidence. Uh, and now I have to make decisions about how much of my workforce I keep in the UK or not. What, because of the increase in employers' national insurance it's, contributions? Uh, it's going to cost a lot more. And you're thinking you might actually have to have fewer workers in Britain and have more elsewhere as it's, a result? It's something I have to consider. In the private sector, we have to make money, costs go up, we've got to balance the books. Well, Darren, that cannot have been the response you would have wanted from the budget yesterday. Well, look, it was a budget that meets the scale of the challenges we face as a, as a country. The key word on the front of the Labour Party manifesto was change. And it was change from years of chaos from the last Conservative government that you will have experienced with inflation going through the roof, energy bills going through the roof, uh, the economy spiralling out of control when Liz Truss launched her mini budget. And we have brought fiscal and economic discipline back to Britain. But the budget yesterday had to also balance the books for the country in the same way that you have to balance the books for your company. And we had a £22 billion black hole uh, from the last government that we needed to fill. We needed to clear the slate clean. I mean, the uh, OBR, as you say, as the Office of Budget Responsibility, talks about £9.5 billion. You keep talking about £22 billion. They're two different figures, but do carry sure, on. Sure, sure. And we've published a spreadsheet that shows you line by line what the £22 billion uh, is, which you can see, which was released with the budget yesterday. So you can so scrutinise the detail. So what do you say to Janet? Because Janet's a business person. She's actually thinking about whether or not to employ fewer people here and possibly more people abroad as a direct result of your budget, which... And as we know, you talked about growth mm. endlessly before the budget, and you want, to, you want businesses to grow. Janet's thinking she might have to shrink her business here. 
Sure, but growth comes because there is confidence in the UK economy. We'd lost confidence of investors and many businesses in the run-up to the last election. So getting a grip of public finances, getting inflation under control, investing in our public services so that workers who are at home sick and can't get an NHS appointment can do so, parents, predominantly mums, that maybe want to work full-time but need to drop their kids off at breakfast clubs can now do so. Yeah, but if answer need... Janet directly, because there's a real-life example of the effect of your budget on her and it's not a good one. Well, I'm, what I'm, the point I'm making is that if you look at the package in the whole in the budget, we think there's lots of pro-growth investment and interventions in the country alongside fiscal and economic stability, which is important. But let, let me go to the tax question head on, because that's the root of uh, your concern, which I understand and empathise with as an employer. We had to balance the books that we'd inherited, and that meant that as a government, you've got to make a decision, you've got to make some choices about how to do that. But we made a very clear promise in our manifesto not to increase income tax on national insurance for working people, employees in their payslip, not to increase VAT that we all pay for in the shops, and for businesses to maintain corporation tax at the current level for the time of this parliament. That meant that as a consequence of the inherited mess that we had to deal with, we had to look elsewhere, uh, and that's why we had to make the decisions we did in the budget yesterday. Tom, do you see much growth in the budget? No. Um... Janet, I have got every sympathy with you. There is no economy in the world that's ever taxed its way to economic growth. And, Darren, you're a very clever man, but you understand that as well. So my phone was ringing off the hook last night. We help businesses start and grow. And um, just, just one example, and I would love to take you, Darren, so you could listen. We should have a cup of tea with Janet after the programme because I have a friend who's got a business, 30 retail units in the UK, um, turning over, you know, about £40 million. But the NI, lowering of the threshold and increasing the rate, is going to cost them half a million. And the new living wage is going to cost about 800000 So that's £1.3 million out of his profits. So what does he do? He's saying three of my units are now not profitable. I may need to close them. So that means he's going to pay off 90 people. 90 people. Let's just assume half of them find a job somewhere else. That's 45 people who are not paying their tax, who are not paying their NI, and even worse, are now asking for benefits. So that is not growth. So I am extremely worried about this. We have plenty of entrepreneurs you could speak to. Janet is one of them. And I would just, we really want you to succeed, but I'm really worried. There is nothing to encourage people like Janice in this budget. And Tom, can I just say, because you, you describe yourself as politically neutral. I do. Do you have any sympathy with, with I'm sure, an argument, well, you've made it already, Darren, and Rachel Rees has too, that it was a terrible inheritance? Yeah. From the previous government? I have a lot of sympathy. Um, and, but... My whole thing is that governments don't create wealth. People like Janet, hard-working people like Janet, um, and entrepreneurs who are willing to risk their own capital, grow, create the jobs, those people pay their taxes and their NI. That's how we grow the tax take. People get caught up in tax rate. The tax take is what pays for the nurses, the doctors, the policemen, the teachers, it's not the tax rate. So I do have sympathy, of course. The last government completely mucked it up in the end. But if I hear one more time about a 22 million back hole, I'm going to jump in the black hole. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear it from our audience. Woman in the red dress. Hi, um, yeah, I run a factory in Hampshire. I employ 60 people. And you promised them that you wouldn't put taxes on them. You've put them on me, which leaves me in a position to make very difficult decisions, and you've made me the villain of the police. How, how could you hide behind the business owners of this country and do that to us whilst promising the tax voters that you weren't going to raise taxes on them? So, so look, in, in response to your question, and I, I totally hear you, and also Tom's point, I agree with everything that you said, Tom, 
you know, as a new government... What, when he said he heard nothing about growth in the budget? Do you agree with that? Well, I didn't agree with that bit, but we can talk about that next. But the, the, the point about enterprise and, uh, and growth... with me. Well, the, the economy is growing, actually, over the forecast period. But let me just come back By to the... A teeny tiny amount. Well, compare the growth rates from before the election to By now after the election. It's growing more, but is there more to do? Absolutely. But let me just come to this question of the tax thing, because it's really important, right? So we come into government um, as, as a new set of ministers... And we're told we've got a lot of heavy lifting to do to balance the books. Now, I'm going to use the £22 billion, pounds, but bear with me. Right, £22 billion. Pounds. I, I, and I'll point you all There's to the spreadsheet. There's a sort of muttering of dissent <laughs> in okay, the order, okay. so I don't know if let you can me, hear it at home. Let, let, let me use a different number so I can illustrate the point. £10 billion, pounds, shortfall. Uh, and officials say to us, what are you going to do? Are you going to cut £10 billion pounds from public services? Are you going to increase taxes? Or are you going to borrow £10 billion... Pounds every single year and add to the national debt in order to pay for that. Those are your three choices. Now, on tax, in our manifesto, we made this commitment on income tax, national insurance and VAT for working people. That's a promise in our manifesto. You can't come in as a new government and say, I'm now going to break the promise in that manifesto this side of the election, because... People already think that. Well, lots as of you know, some people are saying are you effectively are breaking that promise. Well, I refute in fact, that very strongly. People's, I refute people it very are, are going to experience is, the effect of the increase in the the point, national insurance in sure, their wage but the, but, the, but the point with respect is you have to choose. You have to choose. You can't come into government and ignore the problem. You have to All choose. Right. Well, look, we have lots of hands up. I'm going to come to the rest of you as well. But let's hear what our audience thinks of the choices you've made. Yes, man there in the dark sweater. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Darren, I don't know why you ring fenced the NI, VAT and income tax. Um, it's like you did it to make a political point in an election which you were always going to win. Um, I think most reasonable working people would prepare, be prepared to pay a bit extra to get the services they want. OK. Man in the, in the white shirt and the dark blue jacket. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, also a business owner, so I'll join you for that cup of tea, Tom. Um, <laughs> Great. Uh, there's only 27 people in our company, but, but it sounds like you've upset all of the people that are uh, owning businesses. And fundamentally, where is the platform for growth for our, for our businesses? You, you've taxed us, thank you. Now what do we do to actually grow? My business is growing at 60% year on year, so, so we're in a good place, but you've just made it more difficult. OK, let me hear from the man in the pink shirt with the glasses there. Yeah. I mean, the Labour Party made a point of saying they were going to make the people with the broadest shoulders pay the most. The only real action I heard in yesterday's budget was about raising the tax on private jets. I mean, that's not in a drop in the ocean. Why did you go for the poor uh, employers over the people who have much deeper pockets? I was very disappointed when I saw that. Let me, before I come to Andrew, let me just ask, is there anyone here who, who saw stuff in the budget that they welcome? OK. Some hands are up. OK, it looked like it was going to be no, but there are hands up, so let's hear from someone. Yes, the woman in... You put your hand up with a blue top and the glasses, yeah. Um, oh, now you put me on the spot. <laughs> um, the, the transport links, I think, was a good one, especially for up north. I've got family up north who could well, will welcome that. So. OK. Uh, the man there in the front with the black sweater. Um, I think um, employment law has needed a change, particularly in the probation period for when you start a new job. If you look at across Europe, um, their rules are a bit more strict on that, and I think that was something that I actually was really surprised about, that um, definitely needed some kind of um, reform, because in the UK, two years is a long time to wait. Having personally experienced losing my job um, in an instant and being asked to leave the office... And all of a sudden, I've got children, family, bills, thousands of pounds going out a month with mortgages, etc. What the hell am I going to do? So I can speak from personal experience. It does happen. And I was within the two-year threshold, and the company said, we don't need to give you a reason. We can just get rid of you. So those reforms to workers' rights, something you, yeah. you, you welcome. Yes, the, the, yes, you've got glasses there. Yes, the young man there. Yeah. Uh, I was very pleased to see Labour follow through on their promise to introduce VAT on private school fees especially if it does help fund state education. OK. Uh, Andrew, that's not something you welcome, though, is it? Well, I don't welcome this budget, and, and I completely understand the point Janet made. Local businesses in my constituency, uh, farmers, uh, even people who are care workers, uh, are incredibly frustrated by what they feel, and we'll have some semantics, as Darren and I often tour the TV studios, but what they feel are Labour's broken promises. Right. They said they wouldn't put tax on working people. 
And, and there wasn't some small print that they're now pointing to after the event. Their manifesto was very explicit, not on working people, not on national insurance. They said they wouldn't change the fiscal rules. And they said that they wouldn't increase borrowing. They said their plans were fully funded. Um, and they've done all of those things. They've changed the fiscal rules. They've increased taxes by the biggest amount in peacetime in this country. But that's not, that's not the end of it. Because then they went I mean, further. Before that, and it was borrowed. you, of course. They've it borrowed. was your government before that. During so COVID, and then taxes were, taxes were falling COVID. in our government. Um, but they've also added to the national debt that's going to pass down a burden to the next generation. And as the OBR themselves say, is going to keep inflation and interest rates higher for longer. So it's going to cost people in their mortgages. The fact that they chose national insurance, which is a tax on jobs, not my words, Rachel Reeves' words, means that it's often the youngest workers who will pay the price. Those who've been with a firm the longest. Janet, the difficult decisions that you and employers up and down the country make. Uh, people feel incredibly let down. Darren, I don't suppose you will, but you should be apologising to people uh, for creating that sense of trust and then so quickly, after a mere 115 days in office, coming back with what were clearly premeditated plans to raise taxes all over the board. Can I and come... do you think you should be apologising, Andrew, for what even the, uh, the Institute of Fiscal Studies is referring to as, as the pretty lamentable inheritance that Labour got? Well, look, every, um, every government... I mean, no, no government gets things right, uh, and I'm more than happy to take my fair share of responsibility for things that the previous government didn't get right. That's why, no doubt, many people in this room didn't vote for us. They did, like Janet, give Darren's party a chance on the premise that they would stick to their word, they wouldn't breach their promises, uh, and they wouldn't put, put up taxes. But, look, every... I was a finance director. Um, I spent nearly 20 years trying to balance the books. And, of course, the public finances will be tight. They should be tight, because you're spending taxpayers' money. Okay. You're making difficult decisions. Yeah. There shouldn't be any flab in that, but there are always ways in which you can balance the books. And what we didn't see... We saw lots of borrowing, we saw lots of extra taxes, what we didn't see is any productivity improvements. We didn't see any welfare reform. So you can still have the investment in our not, public that's services. That's just not true, Andrew. Well, is the, it? The, welf the welfare bill grows by over £100 back, billion okay. pounds over this plan. Okay, and it's one of the things me, that the OBR calls out. Let me, from the rest of the panel, Munira. There were things that I know that, that, that the Lib Dems welcomed in this budget, particularly in terms of health care. Uh, yes, and uh, Liberal Democrats campaigned on... Uh, investing in our health and care services and we called for an emergency budget to save our health and care services so we welcome that there has been investment in the NHS but the big elephant in the room of course was that there was nothing on social care and you cannot fix the NHS if you don't fix social care. Well, I think this um, is something we might actually be coming to. OK, well, so, all right. So, so if we... Uh, if there are, what yeah, about the rest but of the I will, Coming back to Janet's question, actually, and, and the other business owners in the audience on, on growth and what is effectively a jobs tax. I mean, look, let's be frank. The Conservatives left the economy in a terrible mess and public services on their knees. So we were always going to need investment in public services, particularly in our, as I've said, in our health and care service and in our schools. Liberal Democrats set out a whole raft of tax measures during the election campaign where we could have raised some of that money a lot more fairly. This uh, rise in national insurance is a jobs tax. Two thirds of it will be paid by employees, by lower wages and people being laid off, as we've heard from the various business owners in the room. It is going to penalise small businesses. And what really worried me is when you look at the forecast for growth from the Office for Budget Responsibility, it doesn't go above 2% in the forecast at all. Yes, we need to fix our NHS and care service to get more people into work to boost growth. We also need to radically reform the business rate system to support our small businesses because at the moment it is terribly unfair. But the, big, the other big elephant in the room, of course, is Brexit. And this government won't, like the previous government, do anything to repair our broken relationship with Europe. And if we are serious about getting growth back, we have got to start to repair our relationship with Europe. But Keir Starmer, as, as even in the long term, has written off any idea of going back into the single market. We know that's hit growth by 4%. I've got businesses in my constituency. One premium cycling business lost 25% of its business overnight as a result right. of Brexit red tape. They're, they've 
okay. tried to fill that gap again, but how much more could they have grown if they hadn't had that right. impact? <laughs> Craig, what was your response? I mean, we had Rachel Reeves said uh, before the budget, taxes are at 70. Huh? I don't have plans to be a big tax raising chancellor. It's quite yeah. a lot of tax. Well, Janet, I'm not an economist, but what I did hear in your question was uh, about what you were told and then what actually happened. And I do think that that is a major issue in this. So you say, I don't have plans to be a big tax raising chancellor, Rachel Reeves, the Labour manifesto, we will not increase national insurance. Uh, none of my plans involve major tax rises from Keir Starmer. I think that's problematic. And I think what you're hearing from a lot of people is, you know, is the government actually telling us the truth? Is it actually telling us being loose with language? Or if you're being uncharitable, does it sometimes feel like it's slightly gaslighting us about this kind of thing? It has been explicit about some of the things it's going to, it's been going to be doing and what it's going to be saying. And then it seems to be pulling back from that. And I think the other big problem with this, I think, is, that's going on here is any government needs to be able to say what it's doing, why it's doing it, how it's doing it and who it is for. And I think this government's really struggling with the big vision thing. We had 120 days where there was a massive vacuum and there was lots of doom and gloom going on. We were told this was going to be a budget for strivers. We've heard from all the small business owners here tonight saying that there's a problem with that. And I think that this government is really struggling to say to people, what is it actually going to do and how is it going to be when we get there? So there is a trust issue here. Keir Starmer did tell everybody he was going to be different. And a lot of people, I think, have got a big question mark and saying, are you going to be different or are you actually just going to say what is necessary to get into power and then change things afterwards? Yeah. Look, I refute every single accusation of dishonesty. And if we have time, we can go through them <laughs> absolutely line by line. But the thing with this budget is it was an honest budget. It was an honest budget about the inheritance from the Conservatives. It was an honest budget about the poor state of our public services. It was an honest budget about how much it costs to get a grip of public finance. But hang on a second, Janet. So when Rachel Reeves said, I don't have plans to be a big tax-raising chancellor, and tax is now going to be at record levels, how, how do those two facts because, go together? Because this budget's trying to do two things. It's trying to clear up the mess that we inherited, that you... Me, no, I get that, and you OBR. said that, but I'm just talking you say you to you refute all, all, yeah, yeah. all, so, all things that you've been saying. But how do those two facts, how can both those two well, things be Well, because true? you then have to deal with the reality as you find it when you come into uh, government. And look, colleagues here are calling for tax cuts or more spending. All of these things have to be paid for. How would you pay for them? And look, to be fair to Andrew, and we've worked together for many years, I'm very fond of him. Um, uh, yeah. No, no. I, Not entirely, I, I, sure, it's very I, I, so, <laughs> I, You know, I... <laughs> I'm a nice guy, right? I mean, I'm fond of Andrew. We work well together on the Science and Technology Select Committee. Um, and he knows what he's talking about. Because Andrew was Economic Secretary to the Treasury when Liz Truss was Prime Minister. And what happened then, Andrew? <laughs> when you ignored the OBR, when you sacked the Permanent Secretary at the Treasury, when you announced £45 billion of unfunded tax cuts, when you sent the market spiralling, mortgage rates going through the roof, and completely discredited your party in the economy. That is the mess that we're having to deal with. That's why this is an honest budget. Did I want that inheritance? Absolutely not. Well, you may well have wanted... Um, and we, sh we shouldn't just look backwards, Darren, because you are in government, and to govern... That's why we're making the choices. No, 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 no it's, that's not right. You What's your choice? You what would you do instead? You inherited... What would you do instead? You inherited... What would you do instead? I'll let you, I'll let you rant. Well, tell, them, um, tell the audience your choice. You, in, you, inherited an econ choice? you inherited an economy where inflation had come down from 11.1% to 2%, where interest rates were falling and we were able to bring taxes down, and we presented balanced forecast to the OBR... That's not that what the OBR said. On the, ..on the current fiscal rules that had good headroom in them. Hang on, the OBR no, no, no. said there were figures that, that, that were not clear to they them. They said it was materially different because you were not transparent about the state no, of public finances. No, no that's, that's... That's the language of the OBR report. I've no, just quoted it. It's simply not true. And the OBR, this, true. The OBR speaking on the Today programme this morning on the BBC uh, talked about how nobody should be using their figures and their words to legitimise what Darren has been talking about. In fact, there's no mention okay, of 22 billion... OK, but you're, billion using, the, you're the, using their the words OBR. to legitimise what you're talking about. So let's, let's just call a halt there for a minute, because this is one aspect of the budget we're talking about. There is a question on another aspect of the budget I want to get to, and that is from Charles Louis or Lewis. I'm not sure how to say your name. Yes. Will the billions being spent on NHS really fix the actual problems, such as lack of staff, and lack of decent hospitals. Right, so there's a £25 billion rise in the NHS budget over two years. That was what was announced yesterday. Uh, Manira. Well, 
there are a lot of questions to be answered. It's a eye-watering amount of money. Um, we haven't seen the detail of how it's going to be spent. Uh, you asked about new hospitals. I mean, we were promised 40 new hospitals by the Conservatives, were a complete, which were a complete and utter fiction. We've not had any reassurance from the Labour government that those are going to be built. My, my concern is that if we want to try and fix the NHS, we've got to fix the front door and the back door. By the front door, I mean primary care, so investing in our GPs, pharmacies, dentists, and also in our public health to prevent people getting ill in the first place. So there's fewer people going into hospital. And then we've got to fix the back door, which means sorting out social care so that when people are well enough, they can be discharged, but there just aren't enough people, to your point. Uh, we're, uh, working in our social care sector, we need to boost their wages. And actually, the employer's national insurance rise is going to put a lot of our social care providers under a lot of pressure because the vast majority of social care providers, whether they're care homes or providing care in your own home, are private providers. And they are going to have to shoulder the burden of this national insurance rise. So I haven't heard anything on social care. We didn't get any commitment on public health. Uh, and we've yet to see the detail of how these billions are going to be spent. So whilst Liberal Democrats, as I say, campaigned on health and care, and uh, West Streeting, when he got uh, into office, said he had 72 Liberal Democrat pen pals because we were all writing to him about hospital projects and other health projects in our constituencies. So we, we, we okay. consider it a Lib Dem win that there was a strong focus on health. There's a lot of questions still to be answered uh, and we need to see that breakdown. We need to see investment in technology to make it much more efficient. Uh, okay. And we all know that NHS technology is dire at right. times. Let, me, let me hear from the rest of the panel. Tom. OK, so um, NHS, Wes Streeting has taken over and he's, I, I actually think he's been very articulate but I always judge people and what they do and not what they say, and it's early days. Um, but he says the system's broken, but he's going to fix it. So it has to be welcomed £23 billion into well, national... 25, actually. 25, OK, I've got my numbers wrong. 25, but, but if you put £25 billion into a system that's broken and expect different results, that's the definition of insanity. And therefore, I mean, what, what I've spent my life doing is going into companies that are usually broken, and I go and listen to the people who are doing the work on the front line, and they normally know what's what. And then we just sack the people above them, the directors, and we get on with it. So I understand that Wes has looked around the world. I think there's been lots of good um, reports from very, very prominent people. But now the hard job is to manage one and a half million people. That is almost impossible. This is the hardest job in government, is to manage the NHS. What I would like to see, I would like to see a hypothecated tax for the NHS. So I actually... a specific uh, part of everyone's tax yeah. to go directly for the NHS and only for the NHS. Absolutely. And I actually agree that those with the broadest shoulders should carry the heaviest burden, of course. And I would like to see a tax specifically for the NHS and then hold government to account. Because, let's face it, this system we have of hard-working people grow their businesses, the government taxes, the government tax you and me, and then they decide how to spend it, the government, and this is not a party political statement, but governments are not very good at spending our money. In this um, budget, 11.8 billion has been set aside for the blood scandal. 1.8 billion has been set aside for the Horizon scandal. Both terrible scandals. 700 million was wasted in Rwanda. There was a 10 billion IT project way back 2011. Interestingly, guess which company the IT system was? It was Fujitsu, who also put in the Horizon system. I think somebody should be knocking on their door for the money. But imagine if the government had run those things better, they wouldn't be coming to us and taxing us for all this money. We could afford the nurses, the doctors, the frontline care staff. So I'm worried once we give governments our money, what they do with it. All right. Let's let me hear the <laughs>
the in the white T-shirt. Yes. Hi. Um, it really feels that look, every government that comes in they have some other reason or some other idea for the NHS service. Do we not think that rather than keeping the NHS as a political pawn in, in, government, in politics, can we not do something that's more bipartisan or maybe a civil assembly? OK. Man behind you in the white T-shirt. Um, I just find it really depressing watching you two thrash it out. So you're you... talking about Darren and Andrew here? Darren and Andrew. They're very My fond entire... of each other. My entire... <laughs> Apparently they're great mates. Well, yeah. yeah. I'd hate to see someone you don't get on with. But um, my entire life, boom and bust. Whenever there's a change from Tory to Labour, Labour will come in, Tory will come in, like Cameron did in 2010, and the Labour lot left a note saying, ha-ha, there's no money left. Then the Tories smash the economy and Labour come in and say, oh, you know, we've got to fill this... 40 billion, 9 billion, 22 billion changes by the day. Who knows? Who knows how big this black hole is? And then you've got the arrogance of the Tory chap there saying, well, you know, we were doing a great job on inflation and all the rest of it. You trashed the economy and it was starting to just about recover. Don't take any credit. That is disingenuous. I do not understand. I do not understand how out of 65 million people or however many people there are in this country, we end up with economically illiterate people in the government. <laughs> Boom and bust. Boom and bust. All the time. All the time. You are, you, you know, not fit for office, these people. This is our money. This is our money. And I'm sick of being asked to pay more and more and more. I feel poorer than I did 15 years ago. Pay more and more to get less and less. And with regards to the NHS, you can tip as much money in it as you want. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and again and expecting a different result. You can tip all the money in the world in there. Nothing will change. OK. I'm tempted to say, why don't you just get off the fence? <laughs> <laughs> we hear you. Craig. Well, look, I think to be I mean, that was very powerful stuff. It is powerful stuff, but I, look, I do think, to be fair to West Streeting, they are saying, look, that it's time for there to be productivity improvements, it's time for there to be reforms. And huge amounts of money has gone into the NHS, and it hasn't gone on necessarily the right things. I was reading the other day that we have the lowest number of MRI scanners in the Western world in this country. So if you pour the money in and you haven't got the equipment to actually treat people properly, it's a problem. Mm. So there does you have to be reform. You also need the staff to then work the you MRI do need, scanners. No, no, totally agree with all of that. You do need the staff. But I do think that the, what the, the lady was saying there about there needing to be a cross-party consensus on this. Actually, I think if you took people out of this room and said, look, we're all pretty agreed, it is pretty broken, it does need reform, actually we're going to be grown-up politicians and decide how to work together on it and deliver that across parliaments, that would be the positive thing to do. That's what needs to happen. I hope that Red Streeting is going to deliver. I think he's being a little too cautious at the moment, all this kind of stuff. I need, I need to talk to all these people, I need to find out. I think he's pretty clear on what he needs to do and he probably should just get on with it. Woman here in the front with the glasses. Um, you mentioned public health prevention, and I think it's extremely important to, to mention that for public health prevention and to reduce health inequalities, we need to ensure that there is time and sustainable investment in our healthcare system. And we also need to ensure that we are focusing on our inclusion health groups, those that are more vulnerable and have protected characteristics, such as learning disability, autism, homelessness, migrants, and so on. And I think without that, we won't be able to um, make the change that we want to. OK. Well, Darren, let's come to you. So, hardly a ring endorsement from our friend back there in terms of just constant <coughs> boom and bust, and you can pour as much money as you want to the NHS and it will just keep yeah. swallowing it up. And then what about Manira's point about uh, uh, workers in social care, for example? I mean, also GPs and staff, I mean, charities like Marie Curie, they are all going to be affected by this employer's rise in national insurance. Is that money going to go into the Treasury? Or is it going to go back to the NHS? Yeah. Um, and look, sir, I hear your frustration. I, I will just say, though, that if I believe... You also said you're economically illiterate. No, I heard that. <laughs> and um, uh, you're, you're, and you. you're, you're, entitled, you're entitled to your view, and I respect it, sir. But I, I would just say to you, if I believed that nothing would ever change, I wouldn't be sat here today. I'd go off and do something else and not have to sit in front of audiences on national television trying to set out 
how we're trying to change things. I am optimistic about the ability for government and our country to rise to the challenges in front of us. I am optimistic about the role that politicians can play in our democratic system because the alternatives, quite frankly, are not a system that I would want to be part of. And look, are things hard? Absolutely they are. I mean, I've learned that in the first few months of being in government. Lots of things are hard, but you have to lift your head above all of the hard decisions and recognise that you're trying to take the country in a direction, you're trying to improve people's lives, you're trying to make Britain a better place to live in um, and to work, and you have to believe in our democratic system to deliver that, otherwise you lose all hope. But to come to your question about the um, NHS, it needs reform. I mean, Wes has been very, very clear about that. The money we've put in is money to put in to deal with the huge backlogs. So many people waiting at home for their elective treatments. We need to get them in. We need to get them seen. But, but if, if it needs reform, I mean, Keir Starmer said, for example, in September, hear me when I say this, no more money without reform. Yeah. You've just given a whole load of money well, without any reform. No, no, the reform is conditional. But look, the, the, the challenge here is... But, so what is the reform then? Well, you, let me just answer the first bit. You've got to do both at the same time. That is why this is hard. You can't say to those patients waiting on the elective list, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pay for you to get your hip done because I'm paying for reform. You've got to get those patients seen and you've got to do reform. And again, that is difficult to do, but the NHS is the first to recognise, as well as ministers who help lead NHS England, uh, that the system needs to improve. And you know, just at a demographic level, as a country, our population's getting older, there's more demand in the system, um, and the NHS is not performing well. So it's difficult, but reform and growth are the watchwords of this government, because growth is the only way to sustainably get a grip of public finances, and reform is the only way to be able to improve public services for the people okay. that rely on them and the people what that work in it. What about Manira's point about employer national insurance for charities like Marie Curie, for uh, workers in social care, uh, for employers of, of workers in social care, and for GPs and their staff? Where's that money going? Because they're going to have to pay higher wage costs. Sure. So the employer national insurance contributions, other than for small organisations, and, and actually... No, but specifically for workers in healthcare. No, no, but there might be small businesses, which is why I make the point. We've designed the system so that it protects the smallest businesses. So the OBR has confirmed that over 50% of businesses will either not pay any more than they're already paying, or they'll pay less or nothing at all, because we've increased the threshold, the allowance from £5,000 to £10,500 a year. Many small businesses today are realising they're going to pay less under this arrangement than they did before. So for small organisations, uh, we have tried to protect them from the decision we had to take about raising taxes. For the broader public sector, because of course this is all ultimately a cost for the Treasury, uh, we're going to be working that through the system, understanding the implications for different public services, and okay, we'll have to so find a way to, to pay this, the so, bill. So, so GP surgeries and their staff, are they going to have to pay employers' national insurance contributions? And if they do, is it going to go back into the NHS? Because clearly they are part of the healthcare system. So GP surgeries are privately owned partnerships. Yep. They're not part of the public sector. They will therefore have to pay them. But how much they pay will depend on the size. But it won't be going back into the NHS, it'll be going to the Treasury. Well, is it will come right? to the Treasury, as taxes always do. Um, but of course, we've made the commitment to put money directly into the NHS, okay. so that it will flow through, yes. Andrew. I'll, I'll be quick in the interests of time. Um, the answer that Darren's struggling to give but isn't, um, the truthful answer is that many organisations will end up eating that cost. So if you're the NHS, you will get in the finances, in the budget, a big bung of money to cover that national insurance. If you're a local authority, you may get some of that money. But if you're a charity, if you're providing Marie Curie nurses or Macmillan or the voluntary sector, you won't be compensated for that national insurance you'll have to find that money from somewhere else or you'll have to make some even more difficult choices. So I agree with Nira about the care sector. Ultimately, the NHS system relies critically on what happens at the end of that pipeline. And the end of that pipeline is very often uh, the care sector. There was, to the gentleman's point, which I don't agree with, I don't think that's fair, Darren and I and everyone on this platform are well-meaning, trying to make some very difficult decisions dealing with an ageing population and some of the challenges on all Western economies have on public finances. So I don't agree with that. That's not a fair criticism of what any of us well-meaning are trying to do. But there was a cross-party agreement on Dilnut. And, and it would be... So that, that was a review of, 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 of how care, to pay for social care, care. Of how we pay as a society for long-term social care. It dates back to 2011. And I would very much like to see... And I understand that when you come into government, there's lots of things coming at you all at once. But I would very much like to see us get that Dilnut consensus that we did move forward with and implement. 
uh, under our government uh, was, going can forward. Can I just say, on that point, there was I a mean, consensus. We legislated for it during the coalition years, and as soon as the Liberal Democrats left government, George Osborne decided not to implement it, and then we've ended up with another decade of complete inertia on social care. So there was a... The, the, we, we legislated You predate for it. me, because I was only elected in the last government. But what is clear? What government, is clear? Hang on. What is... 2019, Andrew? The last government did it's, move it's forward. It's well documented. It was, there, was, there was legislation, and it wasn't implemented because Osborne didn't want to I don't, I don't want to upset our friend again, but, but it was... It, we, we had implemented Dilnet. Uh, it was going to come in. Wow. It's, it's at the yes, very least... Yes, but under the Conservative government, it didn't come in. No. It, it was... It, it didn't. No, it didn't. There's no question. The one, there was an and Andrew Dillnett review, and it was going to limit the amount that people were going to pay for social care, and it never Hang came on. in. We can't, on the one hand, say that we want to plan for the long term. When a government then makes a commitment for the long term, and there was a consensus about Dillnett... But it didn't do it. That's the point. Well, it, it was going to come in this year. I mean, it takes time. If you go to every... OK, that's If you go to every... 13 years, that's quite a long time. If you go to every local authority in the country... All these right. things take time, but you didn't okay. let me answer the question on the NHS. We Very as a, briefly, we as a society can absolutely rediscover how to deliver world-class healthcare. Mm. Our life sciences companies, as Minister, are the best in the world. The personalised medicine that we're able to do, the things that can be done with data, the application of AI, I'll stop because you want to keep me short. But absolutely, as a society, we've got it within ourselves to deliver that. You have to put in the money. The debate we're having tonight is not about the level of investment, it's about the choices you make, the values okay. as to where you get that money from. All we right. can do this. We're going to take... Uh, probably only got time for one more question, actually, but before we get to that question, I just want to say where we're going to be next week, in case you would like to come and be part of the audience and put in your, your opinion. Uh, we're off to Hartlepool in North East, North East England next week, and the week after that we're in Basingstoke in Hampshire. So follow the instructions on the screen. You can apply to be part of the Question Time audience. We'll take you to the website and we would love to see you. So, Hartlepool or Basingstoke. OK, let's take a, another question now on a completely different topic. Guy, Guy Murphy, whereabouts are you? Ah. With the UK birth rate now at the lowest levels, on record, how would the panel encourage us to have more children? <laughs> <laughs> Got any ideas, Guy? <laughs> or maybe the reduction in the cost of a pint might help. With one P less or something, I think, at the moment. Right, so how would the panel encourage us to have more children? So, the fertility rate in England and Wales uh, and in Scotland uh, has, has fallen to the lowest on record. In, in England and Wales, it's 1.44 children on average per woman. Always feels rather strange putting it that way. In Scotland, it's 1.3. Craig. I'm really glad that this um, topic has come up. I mean, we, this week we've been saying about how important the budget is for the next five, ten years. This is maybe one of the biggest challenges that we're facing as a country going forward. Um, and instead of arguing the toss about who the working person is and having some of the spats that we've maybe had tonight, I think actually hearing from the politicians about what are we actually going to do about this is a really, really serious issue. Um, we look at the graphs of what's going to happen in terms of increased spending because we've got the ageing population and see that tax take is going to be, remain low and there's going to be a huge gap there. How are we actually going to pay for that? How are we going to deal with this? Is it going to have to be increased immigration? A lot of people don't like that. That's a, that's a huge issue. It is one of the big challenges that we are facing as a society going forward and it's going to be a serious problem and we've got to have some answers for it. And I'm not sure that actually, in reality, all the arguments that we've been having going back and forth about the budget, we haven't really actually dealt with, well, what are we going to do for the next generation? Because it's a serious problem. So the UK population at, at the current birth rate, in 50 years, around 27% of the population will be over 65, uh, with around 58% of working age. So, you know, the crucial issue here is obviously is, is how does the working age population support uh, the, the part of the population that is no longer working. Manira. It's a huge challenge, as we've just heard, facing uh, the country. And is there anything government can do? I mean, that's the question. How would the panel well, encourage that? Is there anything government can well, actually I think, do? As far as I see it, one of the key drivers that is preventing people either from having children or, or having more children is, is the cost of having children, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, you look at... Uh, maternity and parental leave pay. I know Kemi Badenoch has said she thinks we should slash it all together. It's actually less than half of the m national minimum wage. So, therefore, if you want to actually take time off, wh uh, you know, whether mother or father or you know, partner wants to take time off uh, to spend with their child at home, it's extremely expensive. And you're going to think, 
many times before you think about doing it. If you then feel that you've got to go back to work because maternity and parental pay is so low, childcare is eye-wateringly expensive. I'm sure it's the same here in Guildford in South West London where my constituency is. If you're looking at full-time childcare per month, it's about £2,000 per child. So if you've so got Manira, can I just point you to under the age of four, you're talking about four grand a month. That's more than the, most so people are paying. So, Manira, let me just point you to because I was, since I knew this question was coming up, yeah. you, you submit your questions when you arrive at the programme and we do a bit of research on that. I did not expect this question to come up, so there's pretty quick for our research on this one. <laughs> so Sweden has also got their lowest birth rate right. on record, and yet they have very generous maternity and, and lengthy maternity and paternity pay, very low childcare costs, and yet they are also struggling with it. Well, I mean, uh, housing costs is also another issue. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what, what, why it is in, in Western economies that we are having fewer children apart from the costs. I think tackling the costs of being, giving families the choice of whether they want to spend more time at home, go out to work. But we've also got to build more houses because housing costs are going up. Okay. And that's one of the big drivers around why people are All right. well, look, there's worried lots about of, having children lots because of, they can't get their homes. Lots of women with their hands on. So let's hear from some of you. Yes, woman in the red jacket. Uh, thank you very much. So I agree with you, Manir. It's extremely expensive to bring a child up in this country. I come from deep poverty and I chose to have one child because I wanted my child to have a quality of life. My worry now is not only are people making choices like me, I'm seeing the younger people looking at us, looking at the taxes, looking at what we have to pay and then saying, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna get my education and I'm gonna go out of the UK. So you've got two effects here, which is really, really worrying. Okay. Woman right at the very back. Um, why would we want to? Why would we want to have more children? Our government has previously, and this one, you are not setting us up for our children to have quality education, quality lives, quality health care. I'm sitting here as somebody who had to stand in a GP surgery and not leave and be threatened to be arrested before my son could have help for his mental health. Why would we want to have more children? Why would we be encouraged to do so when we can't afford them and we cannot support them currently? OK. Woman there in the flowery top. Yes. Hi there. I, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, I think it starts a lot, a lot earlier. So there's university costs, student loans, housing costs for young people. They can't afford to have their own place in order to have a family is happening a lot later. My, my oldest son is 31. He's just about to move to Sweden. It's too expensive. He's, he's saved and saved and saved. He's got about £42,000 in, in a reserve for deposit for a flat. He can't get anywhere near it. Tom? Wow. So I want less government, not more government, and I definitely don't want them poking into my sexual behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> um, Listen, I, can I just tell you, I found out this... I don't think we're going to, by the way. Can I just tell you, because I found, out, I found out this great fact, Tom, which is that in 2022, Vladimir Putin revived what he calls the Mother Heroine Award. Um, mothers are awarded a million rubles, it's about nine grand, once their tenth living child oh. turns one. <laughs> and... They get to meet Putin at an award ceremony. Wow. I tell you, that's how they're doing it over there. Anyway, seriously, so I mean, it's, it's a serious claim. I'm making life with that, but it is clearly a serious. Maybe issue. we should get them to meet Keir Starmer then. <laughs> um, so, but it is serious because the simple economics of it is that more people entering the workforce pay the pensions of those retiring, and we're in a demographic time bomb. Frankly, it's above my pay grade to, to solve this one but I do know we need to solve it. Darren, over to you. OK, Darren, over to you. <laughs> um, uh, look, every child is a blessing. Families bring joy and security and uh, often meaning to our lives and our communities. And it's, I think it's heart-wrenching to know that people are having to think about the kind of family finances, even though that's the responsible thing to do about bringing more children into their families. And, I mean, I'm, we're pulling our weight in my family. I've got three of them, so I think double the... Double the you average. Refer, you refer to that, I'm sure, jokingly, as unit cost units or something. Um, I should explain. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, in public, uh, because politicians choose not to name their children in public for various reasons, I've referred to them as cost centres one, two, and three. <laughs> um, 
Uh, not because I'm a heartless Treasury Minister, mm. although I do reflect the fact they are very expensive yes, they are. Um, until they can become economically active and then we'll mm. start to think about the rate of but return. But seriously, what you're hearing but is a number of people saying economic facts. Obviously, the two-child benefit cap is, 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 mm -hmm. is one thing I'm... I, I suspect a number of people are thinking when they're listening to you saying every child is a blessing. Mm -hmm. I agree. But look, so what is the role of government? I, I think the evidence is clear that it is a cost pressure for families, especially now that over the last few decades, uh, more women are going into work, which is something we celebrate and want to support. But therefore, you need the childcare infrastructure in place to do that. Having been through this process of nursery fees, I mean, it's 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 tough to impossible yes. for many families to we, uh, afford them which is why this government's committed to um, giving funding to primary schools to convert uh, empty classrooms into nurseries so that there's more nursery provision at your local school it's why we're funding breakfast clubs at schools so that if parents need to get to work on time and they can't do that at the moment because of the school drop-off there'll be free breakfast clubs to be able to drop your kids off earlier we, we do have an issue in society where disproportionately politicians have pushed money towards older people and that's just the fact I thought that it was really interesting when you did the winter fuel payment thing I thought you were going to make the argument about fairness and redistribution but again we didn't hear anything about that at all and I think what we're really saying is the young people increasingly feel they don't have a stake in society and people are worried about having another child because they think they're not going to be able to have the stake in society well let's hear from another I'll come to you yes. the man there in the red sweater yeah um, I think beyond the costs and like the only like the personal choice of whether I want to have a child, um, I'm 29. Um, I was a teenager growing up during the um, financial crisis. I was in uni during the entire Brexit saga. Um, I just joined the workforce when I, when the pandemic hit, um, and then waiting through all of that, and then I, I rejoined the workforce. Um, just as things were starting to get going again, and then there's been a cost of living crisis, there's been Liz Truss, there's yeah. been um, all sorts of political goodness knows what. I don't really feel like I'm at, I feel like I've just like left my own childhood. I don't really know whether, I don't, I don't it's just, it's, it all feels it's, so uncertain. It's so uncertain. Yeah. It's so, like, I would want to bring up a child in a stable world. This Absolutely. is not a stable world. I don't feel like I've, uh, my childhood doesn't feel that far behind, even though I'm 29. It's, um, okay. Yeah. All right, now I hear what you're saying. Yes, the man in the... You've got a dark shirt on, I think. Yes. Hi. Yeah, I think it's very difficult nowadays for people to have children. I mean, I don't know how they can survive with their university fees, with the cost of living, not being able to afford a place to live. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older, obviously, and I was in a fortunate position that I can have children and it's been fine, but I dread to think what it would be like nowadays. So, Andrew, is this... Is this something that would you welcome a, a government policy? Would it something you would support? Who knows? I mean, I know you're supporting mm. Kemi Badenoch. Uh, in terms of government intervention through taxation or whatever it might be to encourage people to have more children? Well, look, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, all the surveys I've seen on this suggest still that people, parents, would like to have more children than they actually are. So, so there's a latent level of demand. Yes, societies are changing. One of the great opportunities of an ageing society is there are more grandparents. There are more people at a different point in their life uh, as well. And uh, there's a big part of this to me as a Conservative about how you make family structures uh, really work well. But we have also heard a lot about frictions and, um, and with others in terms of the need to build. One of the challenges, one of the potential challenges of procreation is if people are still living under the same roof as their parents into their... Uh, 20s and late 30s in many cases. So we've got to get down the age at which people have the opportunity uh, to buy homes. Uh, that's about building more. Past governments have done that. This government, I'm sure, will talk about that. It's also about putting those homes in places like the cities, like in London. You know, London should be building. We should be increasing the house, par house target in London. Uh, not reducing it, Darren, that's completely the wrong direction. So I do think government has a role to play. Y you won't solve it alone with government, like many of the big, challenging, sometimes intractable problems we face in society. But where there are particular points of friction and the housing one comes up again and again and again, we have to find an answer to that. No reason why we can't work together on it, but you can't not build homes in London, push them out to places like Guildford and then saying that you're doing the right thing. That's not the right thing. Can I just say, my wife and I have just become grandparents, so have more yeah. children. It's brilliant. Go on, let's hear a bit. The man there in the, in the red sweater, you see with the, with the glasses, yes. 
when you mention the statistic, um, Fiona, about current birth rates, I, I'm a baby boomer. And I think in the 50s, it was five children per woman. I think I saw that. Wow. But what I was going to say Gosh, to the panel... That, that makes my eyes water. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what yes. I was going to say to the panel, that this is a global problem. Um, we've got, we hear about Japan has got concern. We've got Germany and France. And it's about, it's about labour force as well. And as I think Andrew and probably uh, was saying, that it's, it's about generating uh, taxes for future provision. Man here in the, in the yellow sweater, yes. Hi, I've got an 18 month year old son uh, and expecting our second in a couple more months. And we're already weirdly talking about baby number three, but it's <laughs> <laughs> crazily. Um, however, it's cost that really yeah. does prohibit us because we just think, how could we possibly afford to? And would we, like, like my friend here said, you know, diminish their quality of life? And could, a... you, could, could, could anything in the forms of, of tax benefits? I mean, I mean I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, in, in this quick whiz around, what are other countries doing? So, Hungary spends. 5% of its national GDP trying to prop up their birth rate through so all sorts of incentives. It isn't working. But is there anything that would work for you? Well, yeah, I think, I think to be fair, I don't think we would have had baby number two, at least not yet, if it wasn't for Conservatives changing the policies around um, childcare and having more free hours available, which, which obviously comes in in September, and, and gratefully that continues. So that has helped. So I do think there is policies that could help. But I think another impact that's probably influencing this is around kind of people just don't meet up as much anymore. You're younger people, when I was younger, you could go to town, you could go to local hospitality venues and oh, you'd so meet people. So they're just not physically getting and the opportunity. There's a lot of evidence. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're going there with this debate, are we? Right, OK. So I think, that, I, think that, I think that would help, I think, if we saw, if we saw more pubs <laughs> open, more bars open and people to congregate. I think that would help. <laughs> right, they're not doing it in bars, but anyway, I mean, yeah. Whoa, times have changed. Hang on, let me just... Yes, first at the very back, yes. Uh, as a young person trying to save for deposits and trying to find a home, there's also a really big problem with the rental markets at the moment. Young people are having their pockets emptied by landlords providing really, really insufficient housing and really expensive housing. Mm. How do we address mm. that? Mm. OK. And man here in the, in the denim shed. Oh, yes, I mean, we've already talked about the financial challenges uh, in the UK, but I think globally, the conflicts, the wars that are yeah. going on, environmental challenges, yeah. I think that will put a lot of people off yeah. I mean, talking about environmental challenges, I mean, human demand for renewable resources are, are, are enormous. And there's... When we talk about declining birth rate, we tend to talk about terms purely economically. But, I mean, there is an argument, Manira, that actually a declining birth rate is a better thing for the planet. Well, and there, there is that argument, and I, I absolutely agree with the two contributors who said, I think, that the fact that we are in such a volatile world with climate change, wars and all sorts of uh, political volatility is, is feeding into that. Um, I, I still think that we've got to have ch children who will be able to pay into the tax system to then be able to pay our pensions when Darren, Andrew and I retire and, and, and others. But what, one other point I wanted to make is interesting that the birth rate is done uh, by the woman uh, per mother, and I think that speaks to the heart of this. I think one of the big issues is, of course, women now, uh, we don't want to take the hit on our careers by having multiple children. We know the gender pay gap is enormous, and women take such a hit yep. on, their, on their salaries as soon as they have a baby in a way that men don't. And how do we address that? That's got to be through culture change. And one of the ways that government can help with that is around addressing the, t the inequities around paternity leave and shared parental leave. Now, I'm proud it was Liberal Democrats in government who introduced shared parental leave, but the take-up has been very poor. That's partly to do with the rates, which is the point I made earlier, which is why Liberal Democrats have proposed that we should be actually increasing paternity and, and per shared parental pay so that we're encouraging more fathers to be involved. And actually, since COVID, I think we have started to see that shift, particularly with flexible right. working. I see many more dads pushing their buggies um, around. It should become the okay, norm. OK, Minera, I'm going to have to... I hear, we hear what you say. I'm going to have to <laughs> close you. I'm so sorry, because we are out of time. No, no, I'm please don't apologize. Fashion. And quite rightly. <laughs> That is it uh, for this evening. I just want to say thank you to David Howard uh, for these lovely pictures of Guildford. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to all of you for coming along tonight and making your points so, so powerfully. Uh, and thank you, of course, to you at home for watching. From Question Time in Guildford, bye-bye.